Lesson 10 for August 26 through to September 1, The Two Covenants. Sabbath afternoon, August 26. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we open your word again, we thank you that the book of Galatians is there, that Paul took the time to write to the people at that church, but that we can read it too. And as he discusses a very important topic today that sometimes is confusing to us, we pray that your Holy Spirit will give us the clarity of mind and may your word jump out and speak to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Galatians chapter 4 and verse 26. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. Let's read that again, Galatians 4 verse 26. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. Christians who reject the authority of the Old Testament often see the giving of the law on Sinai as inconsistent with the gospel. They conclude that the covenant given on Sinai represents an era, a dispensation, from a time in human history when salvation was based on obedience to the law. But because the people failed to live up to the demands of the law, God, they say, ushered in a new covenant, a covenant of grace through the merits of Jesus Christ. This, then, is their understanding of the two covenants, the old based on law and the new based on grace. However common that view may be, it is wrong. Salvation was never by obedience to the law. Biblical Judaism, from the start, was always a religion of grace. The legalism that Paul was confronting in Galatia was a perversion, not just of Christianity itself, but of the Old Testament itself as well. The two covenants are not matters of time. Instead, they are reflective of human attitudes. They represent two different ways of trying to relate to God, ways that go back to Cain and Abel. The Old Testament represents those who, like Cain, mistakenly rely on their own obedience as a means of pleasing God. In contrast, the New Covenant represents the experience of those who, like Abel, rely wholly upon God's grace to do all that he has promised. Sunday, August 27, Covenant Basics Many regard Paul's interpretation of the history of Israel in Galatians 4, 21-31 as the most difficult passage in his letter. That's because it's a highly complex argument that requires a broad knowledge of Old Testament persons and events. The first step in making sense of this passage is to have a basic understanding of an Old Testament concept central to Paul's argument, the concept of the covenant. Let's read those texts, Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through to 31. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labour. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, 
but of the free. The Hebrew word translated as covenant is berit, B-E-R-I-T. It occurs nearly 300 times in the Old Testament and refers to a binding contract, agreement or treaty. For thousands of years, covenants played an integral role in defining the relationships between people and nations across the ancient Near East. Covenants often involved the slaughter of animals as part of the process of making, literally cutting, a covenant. The killing of animals symbolised what would happen to a party that failed to keep its covenant promises and obligations. Hans K. La Rondel in Our Creator-Redeemer, published in 2005, page 4, writes, From Adam to Jesus, God dealt with humanity by means of a series of covenant promises that centred on a coming Redeemer and which culminated in the Davidic covenant. To Israel in Babylonian captivity, God promised a more effective new covenant in connection with the coming of the Davidic Messiah. Question. What was the basis of God's original covenant with Adam in the Garden of Eden before sin? Well, first of all, we'll look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. Then God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which he had created and made, and in the same chapter, Genesis 2, verses 15 through to 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. While marriage, physical labour and the Sabbath were part of the general provisions of the covenant of creation, its main focal point was God's command not to eat the forbidden fruit. The basic nature of the covenant was obey and live. With a nature created in harmony with God, the Lord did not require the impossible. Obedience was humanity's natural inclination, yet Adam and Eve chose to do what was not natural. And in that act, they not only ruptured the covenant of creation, they made its terms impossible for humans now corrupted by sin. God himself would restore the relationship that Adam and Eve had lost. He did this by enacting a covenant of grace based on the eternal promise of a saviour, which we read about in Genesis 3.15. So, to finish today, read Genesis 3.15, the first gospel promise in the Bible. Where in that verse do you see an inkling of the hope that we have in Christ? Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Monday, August 28, The Abrahamic Covenant Question. What covenant promises did God make to Abram in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through to 5? And what was Abram's response? Genesis chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. 
and Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. God's initial promises to Abram make up one of the most powerful passages in the Old Testament. These verses all are about God's grace. It is God, not Abram, who makes the promises. Abram has done nothing to earn or merit God's favour, nor is there any indication that suggests that God and Abraham have somehow worked together to come up with this agreement. God does all the promising. Abram, in contrast, is called to have faith in the surety of God's promise. Not some flimsy so-called faith, but a faith that is manifested by his leaving his extended family, and at the age of 75 years, and heading to the land God promised. Hans K. Larondell continues in Our Creator Redeemer, pages 22 and 23, with the blessing pronounced on Abraham and through him on all human beings, the Creator renewed his redemptive purpose. He had blessed Adam and Eve in paradise and then blessed Noah and his sons after the flood. This way, God clarified his earlier promise of a Redeemer who will redeem humanity, destroy evil and restore paradise. God confirmed his promise to bless all peoples in his universal outreach. End of quote. Question. After ten years of waiting for the promised son to be born, what questions did Abram have about God's promise? Genesis 15, verses 1 through to 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir. But one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. It often is easy to glorify Abram as the man of faith who never had any questions or doubts. Scripture, however, paints a different picture. Abram believed, but he also had questions along the way. His faith was a growing faith. Like the father in Mark chapter 9, Abram basically said to God in Genesis 15 verse 8, I believe, help my unbelief. In response, God graciously assured Abram of the certainty of his promise by formally entering into a covenant with him in Genesis chapter 15. What makes this passage so surprising is not the fact that God enters a covenant with Abram, but the extent to which God was willing to condescend to do so. Unlike other rulers in the ancient Near East who balked at the idea of making binding promises with their servants, God not only gave his word, but by symbolically passing through the pieces of slaughtered animals, he staked his very life on it. Of course, Jesus ultimately gave his life on Calvary to make his promise a reality. So, to finish today, what are some areas now in which you have to reach out by faith and believe in what seems impossible? How can you learn to keep holding on, no matter what? Tuesday, August 29, Abraham, Sarah and Hagar. Question. Why does Paul have such a disparaging view of the incident with Hagar? 
Galatians chapter 4 verses 21 to 31 and Genesis chapter 16. What crucial point about salvation is Paul making through his use of this Old Testament story? Galatians 4 beginning at verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, and one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. Which things are symbolic? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labour. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And Genesis chapter 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant, whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now. The Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go in to my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. So Abram said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren." Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. For she said, Have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. Observe, it is between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was eighty-six years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Hagar's place in the Genesis story directly is related to Abram's failure to believe God's promise. As an Egyptian slave in Abram's household, Hagar likely came into Abram's possession as one of the many gifts Pharaoh gave to him in the exchange for Sarai, an event associated with Abram's first act of unbelief in God's promise, as was recorded in Genesis chapter 12. After waiting ten years for the promised child to be born, Abram and Sarai remained childless. Concluding that God needed their help, 
Sarai gave Hagar to Abram as a concubine. Although strange to us today, Sarai's plan was quite ingenious. According to ancient customs, a female slave legally could serve as a surrogate mother for her barren mistress. Thus, Sarai could count any child born from her husband and Hagar as her own. While the plan did produce a child, it was not the child God promised. In this story, we have a powerful example of how, when faced with daunting circumstances, even a great man of God had a lapse of faith. In Genesis 17, 18 and 19, Abraham pleaded with God to accept Ishmael as his heir. The Lord, of course, rejected that offer. The only miraculous element in the birth of Ishmael was Sarah's willingness to share her husband with another woman. There was nothing out of the ordinary about the birth of a child to this woman, a child born according to the flesh. Had Abraham trusted in what God had promised him instead of letting the circumstances overcome that trust, none of this would have happened and a lot of grief would have been avoided. Question. In contrast to the birth of Ishmael, look at the circumstances surrounding Isaac's birth. Well, we're going to look at several passages. First of all is Genesis chapter 17, verses 15 through to 19. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not curl her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is one hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, O that Ishmael might live before you. Then God said, No, Sarah your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his descendants after him. And in Genesis 18, verses 10 to 13, And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life, and behold, Sarah your wife shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in years, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old... Shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child, since I am old? And Hebrews chapter 11, verses 11 and 12. By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. And so to finish today, in what ways has your lack of faith in God's promises caused you some pain? How can you learn from these mistakes to take God at his word, no matter what? What choices can you make that can help strengthen your ability to trust God's promises? Wednesday, August 30. Hagar and Mount Sinai. We're going to start today by reading Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 to 31 again. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. Which things are symbolic? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar, 
for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear, break forth and shout, you who are not in labour, for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Question. What type of covenant relationship did God want to establish with his people at Sinai? What similarities does it share with God's promise to Abraham? First of all, we'll look at Exodus chapter 6, verses 2 through to 8. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I'll bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. And Exodus chapter 19, verses 3 to 6. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And Deuteronomy 32, verses 10 to 12. He found him in a desert land, and in the wasteland a howling wilderness. He encircled him, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings, so the Lord alone led him. And there was no foreign God with him. God desired to share the same covenant relationship with the children of Israel at Sinai that he shared with Abraham. In fact, similarities exist between God's words to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1-3 and his words to Moses in Exodus chapter 19. In both cases, God emphasizes what he will do for his people. He does not ask the Israelites to promise to do anything to earn these blessings. Instead, they are to obey as a response to these blessings. The Hebrew word translated to obey in Exodus 19 verse 5, which we've just read, literally means to hear. God's words do not imply a righteousness by works. On the contrary, he wanted Israel to have the same faith that characterized Abraham's response to his promises, at least most of the time. Question. If the covenant relationship God offered to Israel on Sinai is similar to the one given to Abraham, why does Paul identify Mount Sinai with the negative experience of Hagar? And we'll look at some verses here. Exodus 19, 7 to 25, and Hebrews 8, 6 and 7. Well, let's start with that Hebrews 1 first. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 and 
7. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been found for the second. And then Exodus chapter 19, verses 7 through to 25. So Moses came and called for the elders of the people, and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud, that the people may appear when I speak with you and believe you for ever. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down from Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves, that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. With a man or beast he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain." So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. Then he came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down from Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to gaze at the Lord, and many of them perish. Also, let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. But Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, Set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, Away, get down, and then come up, you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. The covenant at Sinai was intended to point out the sinfulness of humanity and the remedy of God's abundant grace, which was typified in the sanctuary service. The problem with the Sinai covenant was not on God's part, but rather on the people's part because of their faulty promises. Instead of responding to God's promises in humility and faith, the Israelites responded with self-confidence. All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. Exodus 19 verse 8. After living as slaves in Egypt for more than 400 years, they had no true concept of God's majesty nor of the extent of their own sinfulness. In the same way that Abraham and Sarah tried to help God fulfill his promises, the Israelites sought to turn God's covenant of grace into a covenant of works. Hagar symbolizes Sinai in that both reveal human attempts at salvation by works. Paul is not claiming that the law given at Sinai was evil or abolished. He is concerned with the Galatians' legalistic misapprehension of the law. Instead of serving, O. Palmer Robertson writes in The Christ of the Covenants, page 181, instead of serving to convict them of the absolute impossibility of pleasing God by law-keeping, the law fostered in them a deeply entrenched determination to depend on personal resources in order to please God. 
Thus the law did not serve the purposes of grace in leading the Judaizers to Christ. Instead, it closed them off from Christ. Thursday, August 31. Ishmael and Isaac today. Paul's brief sketch of Israel's history was designed to counter the arguments made by his opponents who claimed that they were the true descendants of Abraham and that Jerusalem, the centre of Jewish Christianity and the law, was their mother. The Gentiles, they charged, were illegitimate. If they wanted to become true followers of Christ... They must first become sons of Abraham by submitting to the law of circumcision. The truth, Paul says, is the opposite. These legalists are not the sons of Abraham, but illegitimate sons like Ishmael. By placing their trust in circumcision, they are relying on the flesh, as Sarah did with Hagar, and as the Israelites did with God's law at Sinai. Gentile believers, however, are the sons of Abraham, not by natural descent, but like Isaac, by the supernatural. Like Isaac, they were a fulfilment of the promise made to Abraham, writes James Dunn in the Epistle to the Galatians, page 256. Like Isaac, their birth into freedom was the effect of divine grace. Like Isaac, they belong to the column of the covenant of promise. End of quote. Question. What will the true descendants of Abraham face in this world? Galatians four twenty eight to thirty one and Genesis twenty one verses eight to twelve, beginning in Galatians chapter four and verse twenty eight. Now we brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise, but as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And Genesis 28, beginning at verse 8. Also, Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan did not please his father Isaac. So Esau went to Ishmael and took Mahalathath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abram's son the sister of Nabajoth, to be his wife in addition to the wives he had. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones at that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending, and descending on it. Being the promised child brought Isaac not only blessings, but also opposition and persecution. In reference to persecution, Paul has in mind the ceremony of Genesis 21, in which Isaac is being honoured and Ishmael appears to make fun of him. The Hebrew word in Genesis 21 verse 9 literally means to laugh. But Sarah's reaction suggests Ishmael was mocking or ridiculing Isaac. While Ishmael's behaviour might not sound very significant to us today, it reveals the deeper hostilities involved in a situation in which the family birthright is at stake. Many rulers in antiquity tried to secure their position by eliminating potential rivals, including siblings. However, although Isaac faced opposition... He also enjoyed all the privileges of love, protection and favour that went along with being his father's heir. As spiritual descendants of Isaac, we should not be surprised when we suffer hardship and opposition, even from within the church family itself. And so to finish today, in what ways have you suffered persecution, especially from those closest to you because of your faith? Or ask yourself this hard question. Might you be guilty of persecuting others for their faith? Think about it.
Friday, September 1. Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 371 and 372, But if the Abrahamic covenant contained the promise of redemption, why was another covenant formed at Sinai? In their bondage, the people had, to a great extent, lost the knowledge of God and of the principles of the Abrahamic covenant. God brought them to Sinai. He manifested his glory. He gave them his law with the promise of great blessings on condition of obedience. If ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6 the people did not realise the sinfulness of their own hearts, and that without Christ it was impossible for them to keep God's law. And they readily entered into covenant with God, yet only a few weeks passed before they broke their covenant with God and bowed down to worship a graven image. They could not hope for the favour of God through a covenant which they had broken, and now, seeing their sinfulness and their need of pardon, they were brought to feel their need of the Saviour revealed in the Abrahamic covenant and shadowed forth in the sacrificial offerings. Now, by faith and love, they were bound to God as their deliverer from the bondage of sin. Now, they were prepared to appreciate the blessings of the new covenant. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, is your own walk with the Lord more of an old covenant or a new covenant type? How can you tell the difference? Two, what are some of the issues in your local church that are causing tension within its body? How are they being resolved? Though you might find yourself being the victim of persecution, how can you make sure, too, that you aren't the one doing the persecuting? Where's the fine line there? Let's look at Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. And question three. How many times have you made promises to the Lord that you would not do this or that, only to do this or that? How does this sad fact help you understand the meaning of grace? And to summarise this week's lesson, the stories of Hagar, Ishmael and the children of Israel at Sinai illustrate the foolishness of trying to rely upon our own efforts to accomplish what God has promised. This method of self-righteousness is referred to as the Old Covenant. The New Covenant is the everlasting covenant of grace, first established with Adam and Eve after sin, renewed with Abraham, and ultimately fulfilled in Christ. Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Joy in the Morning, Part 1. Mary sat weeping at the roadside outside her home, rocking her young son in her arms. He had been sick almost since birth. Mary took him to many doctors, but still he suffered from terrible coughing spells. Twice he'd been hospitalized, but even the strongest antibiotic didn't end the cough that plagued him. The last doctor had ordered tests and x-rays, but Mary had no more money. For three months, her husband, a carpenter, hadn't found work. They had borrowed thousands of rupees to pay their rent and buy food. Life seemed hopeless. Her husband was depressed. He felt powerless to provide for his family. He saw no way out except to end their miserable lives. When he had suggested suicide, she became angry. But as trouble mounted, she began to think that it might be their only way out. 
As another coughing spell awakened her little boy, Mary saw a neighbour, Madesh, walking toward her. Madesh stopped when she saw Mary crying. "'What's wrong?' Madesh asked tenderly. "'It's Daniel,' replied Mary. "'He's still sick, and I have no money.' Madesh knew of Mary's problem. She had visited Mary several times since her son was born and had tried to help. She also had prayed for the family. "'Don't worry,' she said. "'Our Jesus can help. "'Come to church with me, and my pastor will pray for you.' "'It was Sabbath morning, and Madesh was on her way to church. "'Mary said nothing. "'She dried her tears and followed Madesh. "'When they arrived at the church, the pastor welcomed them. "'When Madesh told the pastor of Mary's problems, "'he assured her that he would pray for her son after the service. "'Mary sat quietly through Sabbath school. "'She had never seen such a service.' Daniel slept in her arms. She listened to the pastor's sermon, wondering if he would give her medicine for her son. When the service ended, Mary remained in the pew waiting. After the pastor had greeted everyone, he returned to the sanctuary and sat down beside Mary. Placing his hand on Daniel's head, he prayed that God would heal the child and show this family his power. Then the pastor gave Mary an envelope filled with herbs, telling her to mix them with honey or water and give it to the boy. Madesh encouraged Mary as they walked home. In Mary's house, Madesh mixed the herbs with hot water because the family had no honey. They spoon-fed it to little Daniel. Madesh prayed with Mary, then went home. And this story is to be continued next week, so you'll have to study next week's lesson too. Remember, God is always faithful. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harrell. It was recorded in the studios of Christian Services for the Blind. This podcast is brought to you by the Sabbath School Department and through the services of Hope Channel.